today. This is a volunteer organization, right? Yes. Yeah. Right, okay. We're going to talk about volunteering this morning. Volunteering opportunities at Norwalk Hospital. And the first speaker is going to be Corey, Corky Stewart. He's president of the board of the Norwalk Hospital Volunteers. Uh, Corky's kind of an interesting guy. I'll learn more about him today. I did not realize that he was a, is it trombone? What did you say? Trombone. Trombone. He's in the, um, the Westport Community Orchestra, but in addition to that, I'll give you some of his background. He's an Air Force veteran. He spent 30 years consulting with such firms as Ross Perot, Arthur Anderson, and Hewitt Associates, and he retired oh, about 10 years ago. Uh, he joined the Norwalk Hospital Volunteer Group in 2010. He served on the volunteer board and became president. And to fill his extra time, he's also a member of the Board of Open Door Shelter in Norwalk. He's lived in Norwalk since 2006 and spent a lot of time in Chappaqua, New York. So come on up, Cork, you can tell us a little bit about volunteering. Thank you, Rick. Okay. I appreciate being here this morning to talk to you about volunteering and really focus on Norwalk Hospital. Uh, one of the things I'll, I'll just mention, Rick, it's been more than 10 years since I retired. I retired in 2000. Oh. I, I made a commitment to retire when I was 55. Uh, so in 2000, I retired, much, much to the shock of my fellow partners. Uh, they couldn't believe that, that I was retiring at that age. And I, I'll tell you right now, that's the best decision I ever made in my life. How because old were you when you retired? I was 55. Wow. Nice work. Good. That's fantastic. You got to talk. You're a consultant. I need, I need a consultant. It, it, it is really interesting. During the early years of my retirement, we were still living in Chappaqua. Bill and Hillary Clinton moved into our neighborhood, so we moved to Norwalk. Uh, <laughs> but that, that, that wasn't the reason. My, my, my wife loved, loves Hillary Clinton. And, and Bill, Bill I, I've run into Bill at Lang's Delicatessen, this big sandwich name for Bill called Big Bob. Uh, which is partly why he had that heart attack a number of years ago. It's not a good sandwich. Uh, but we moved to Norwalk in, in 2006 to be closer to our children and our grandchildren, there and there, and our boat. Our, our, our boat is at the Sakura Kari Club. So we became Norwalk residents pretty quickly. Uh, in order to uh, uh, get involved in Norwalk, I uh, kind of looked around and I was struck immediately with prostate cancer. Oh, wow. That's not a gr great way to get involved in a community. Uh, but I decided to have my prostate removed, and then I underwent 43 days of radiation at Norwalk Hospital. That really led me to, that was my first significant hospital event experience, and it led me to understand and appreciate the care that I received from Norwalk Hospital, and specifically, not in addition to the doctors and the technicians and, and the people I worked with, the volunteers. That's how I got introduced to the volunteers. One of my partners at Hewitt at that time was uh, the, the board chair for the Norwalk Hospital Board. And he convinced me that I needed to join the volunteer program. And I said, sure, uh, that, that's a great way of both meeting people, helping people, and giving back. And so I joined the, the, uh, the, the board, the volunteer board at Norwalk Hospital, and shortly after that became the president of that board. It's supposed to be a two year term. I forget whether I'm six years or eight years into being the president. I can't find anybody else to do it. It's something that I enjoy, I love, and working with our volunteers over the years has been one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. Uh, that role on, 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 with the volunteers has led, led to the position on the uh, hospital board. I've been a hospital board member, the big board, uh, for the hospital now for six years. I think I, I think this is my last year. I, it, it's like three two-year terms. and. So I think I have you know, a few, four, few more months to go on that board. But specifically in terms of volunteering, and specifically to Norwalk Hospital, uh, when I started volunteering, I really was worried about what I was going to do and how difficult would it be and how could I provide help to the patients as well as the doctors, the nurses, the technicians. And I found out something rather, rather quickly, just being there and listening to our, our patients, their fears, their, their apprehensions, their needs, and being able to, whenever I could, get something for them. Sometimes it would be a cup of coffee, or it would be a glass of water, sometimes it would be juice, sometimes it would be grabbing a doctor or a nurse uh, for a specific medical question, 
you know, if you hang around the hospital enough, you think you know medicine. Well, you don't. And so there's a real danger volunteers <clears throat> have, have to uh, fight, and that is giving what they consider to be medical advice or medical experience. Uh, there's a tendency for volunteers, well, I had that. Let me tell you what I went through. Well, <clears throat> that's really not what the patient wants to hear. The patient wants you to listen to them. And sometimes that is just listening. One of my roles at, as a volunteer at the hospital was as an ambassador. Uh, they're the inpatient rooms, and what an ambassador does is uh, arrive on the floor in the morning or the afternoon, whatever the shift is be, and, and see which doors are open. <clears throat> you look in, and if someone's awake, you knock on the door and says, hello, how are you doing today? My name is Corky. I'm a volunteer. Uh, is there anything that I can get for you? Are, are we treating you well? Do you need anything? And just start a conversation. And some of those conversations were just incredible. Uh, some were very short. And I had one volunteer one time that, that was, he was very short, but he said, you're wasting your time here. It's a beautiful day. He said, point to the, it's a beautiful day. The sun's out. What are you doing? You're wasting your life. Get out there and enjoy it. <laughs> and, and so I said, well, okay, I'll, I'll do that later. But right now, I, 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 I'm here. And you know, we ended up talking about baseball. And uh, he became one of my favorite visits on that floor. Uh, other times, there are, there are patients who don't want to talk to you. And you need to say, well, have a great day. Just let me know. Yeah. Uh, let the staff know if there's anything we can do. Yeah. Uh, those are relatively rare. Uh, one of the, 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 the essential uh, uh, responsibilities, and I think characteristics of an ambassador in, in a situation like that, as well as most volunteering opportunities, it's just to introduce yourself and let the patient know that you are there to answer any questions or get any help or help them in any way. Uh, when I volunteered at radiation oncology, since I'd spent 43 days there, uh, you know, get, get, getting radiated myself, uh, I would sometimes just sit down in the waiting room next to a person and just say, how are you doing today? And see where that would take it. And often, a person would tell stories, they'd talk about themselves, they'd talk about their fears, they'd ask about, ask about me. Uh, otherwise, other times they would just wouldn't respond. So I'd sit a little bit longer, and eventually they'd say, well, there is something I need. And so it started a conversation. Uh, so throughout the years, and I, you know, I've been volunteering now there for, for quite a while, my experience with the patients, with the doctors, with the nurses, with the technicians, with the kitchen staff, even with the morgue, and that's horrible, but you know, uh, even with the morgue experience. Uh, working with healthcare workers who care about their patients provides so much more to each one of us when we volunteer than I think we're giving when we do the volunteering. But believe me, the patients uh, relate to the volunteers, uh, they love the volunteers, so does the medical staff. One of the things that the volunteers need to be very careful of is to make sure that the patient understands that they are not medical staff. And therefore, the volunteer needs to make sure that they do not offer advice. Uh, they do not say, well, I don't understand why the doctor recommended that. You know, that, that that's not what was done in my case. I just can't say that. Uh, and, and again, in, in, this, in, in the spirit of trying to give as much information and support, uh, naturally, you, you, you want to talk and speak, and you can't do that. Uh, so with, with that, the, the, the volunteer program at, uh, uh, prior to the pandemic, uh, had, we had close to 500 on our rolls, and that really was about 350 active volunteers. We're down significantly since then because of the pandemic. The volunteering roles at the hospital are just about every department of the hospital. Uh, the transport department, for example, pushes people around in wheelchairs. Uh, they come in the front door, they need a wheelchair, we take them to where they need to be. When they're ready to be discharged, we go up to a wheelchair, bring them down. Uh, the transport individuals are all over the hospital. We have volunteers in the gift shop. If, you, if someone wants to uh, work in or volunteer in a sales environment, the gift shop is a wonderful opportunity to do that. We have volunteers who are at administrative desk positions. And then we have volunteers that, that are in each one of the departments, such as the emergency department. The emergency department is challenging, it's exciting, uh, and sometimes it's, it's sad. Uh, bad things happen often in the emergency department. But fortunately, better things happen more than the bad things happen. Uh, and the emergency department is, 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 is sometimes high pressure, high tension, and all of that. In terms of volunteering schedules, we really try to uh, provide volunteer schedules that meet each volunteer's uh, requirements. So we have volunteers, we have couples uh, who will come in five days a week, six hours a day. Uh, we have other volunteers who will come in 
three hours on one day a week. Uh, so the control, the scheduling, and, and, the, and the knowledge of the volunteer schedules and, and the requirements in each one of the departments is extreme. Uh, and so that requires a lot of administration. If the department has a volunteer, the volunteer can't make it, we try to find a replacement for that particular stretch. Uh, so with that, that that's, that's very quickly, you know, a, a synopsis. I can talk for hours. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> uh, because if Amy's going to come up and, and, and speak about the volunteer program on a broader basis, not only about Norwalk Hospital, but also New Vance. Uh, New Vance is, is, is uh, the, the, the parent, the umbrella over seven hospitals at Norwalk is one of those hospitals. Uh, but, you know, I, e either, well, Rick, you want me to take questions now, or should no, we take questions later? Later on, later. Uh, later on we can get Amy up. Okay, Amy, uh, I'm, I'm gonna turn this back to Rick, but I, I appreciate the opportunity, I appreciate meeting as many of you as I did, and I look <coughs> forward to helping you in any way as you explore whatever the volunteer opportunities might be. And if you wanna hear about the Open Door Shelter <coughs> opportunities and volunteers, yeah. I can certainly <coughs> talk to you sometime about that. Thank you. Thank you. If you want to ask me any questions, I've been volunteering at Norwalk Hospital for 12 years okay. in different departments, and he's right about the emergency department. That, that was a tough one. Um, also, um, now I'm in the Whittingham Cancer Center, and all I do is, is guide people from the waiting room into uh, an area called the blood draw room, where the three or four phlebotomists are there. And, and Corky's right, well, all that's required is to say, good morning, how you doing? Um, is there anything I can help you with? Uh, oh, I'm so thirsty, and you run out and get some water for it. Uh, and I find it very, very fulfilling, I really do. Anyway, that's my pitch. I wanna know how you look in the candy striper uniform. Okay, they don't have those anymore. <laughs> you're huh. dating yourself. We have a blue jacket. <laughs> wow, this volunteer on it. Okay, who's next? Amy, let me tell you a little about Amy. She wants to talk about uh, the peer-to-peer -peer volunteer support program. <coughs> Amy Faith Lionheart is the network manager of volunteer services for New Anth Health. And it's just the hospitals here in Connecticut, Danbury, New Milford, Norwalk, and Sharon. Amy has um, served over 22 years in nonprofit health care as a volunteer administrator, and she's been with New Vance for five and a half years. <coughs> She's a volunteer outside of New Vance, as chairperson of the Connecticut Hospital Association Volunteer Services Group. And she's been recognized by the New England Association of Healthcare Volunteer Administrators for program development. Amy's a resident of Danbury. She has a master's degree from both Iona College and Central Connecticut State University, where she got her MBA. So anyway, that's enough on, um, on Amy. Take it from here. Thank you, Rick. Uh, I'd like to take a moment, actually, to honor Rick for his years of service with Norwalk. Rick is one of our most beloved volunteers and really does so much to enhance and enrich the patient experience. You know, I, I frequently think about this quote uh, Booker T. Washington once said, if you want to lift yourself, lift others. And, and that's so important uh, because, like Corky said, you get so much out of the volunteer experience. I've had volunteers tell me in the past, you know, I don't know if a simple smile and thank you is, is better for the patient or doing more for me, you know? And uh, so I, so I wanna thank you for inviting us here today. Uh, thank you all for, for having us. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity for growth right now. With the pandemic, as Corky mentioned, unfortunately, we've lost a lot of volunteers. And so we are in growth mode right now. You know, uh, throughout the nation, we are facing a turnover crisis in healthcare and education. And so when I think about everything that the volunteers are doing, I have, I have to tell you that volunteers that come into our, walk our halls, 
they are not only uplifting the patients, but they are uplifting the staff as well because they really enrich and enhance the work that the staff are already doing. So, so when you come in and you, and you see those staff and they, they know that you're a volunteer there to support them, it, it really does a lot for them. Uh, you know, during, during the pandemic, we started to plan for a new program, which is our peer-to-peer -peer support program. We've had peer-to-peer -peer support in the past in many different ways, but, but really this is a new way, utilizing telephonic support, utilizing Zoom, uh, and, as well as in-person visits. Uh, you know, so planning, planning a program at any time of the year is a challenge. But during a pandemic, it's ex especially exciting. You, you know, when, you, when you're planning for your programming, whether it's patient-centered or, or staff-focused, you want the support of your stakeholders, right? So who are our stakeholders? Our stakeholders are our champions, our, our staff, our uh, clinicians, the doctors, obviously the patients, anyone who's going to be utilizing the program, right? So you want to gain the support of, of all of those folks. And um, I, came, I came here today with, with a video to show all of you of some of our peer-to-peer -peer supporters in action, uh, but, but uh, I'm going to send those out a little later. I'll send a link a little later. I just want to tell you a little bit more about the the program because we've actually gotten a lot of kudos recently for for this program. In fact, uh, four of us in volunteer services are going to be traveling to Nashville, Tennessee uh, the second week of March because we're actually being honored for our program development through the Society of Healthcare Volunteer Leaders. So, so what can I tell you about peer-to-peer? -peer? Well, you know, uh, we, we started out small. We wanted to start small with this. Uh, we started out with cancer support, and then we took a look at our three institutes. So, Institute for Cancer, uh, Heart and Vascular, and Neurosciences, right? And, and so, just to share a story about one of our Longtime volunteers, and I, I do cover four hospitals. Uh, so, so this is a gentleman who's been volunteering for the past 10, 11 years uh, in in the hospital, providing peer support. He's a stroke survivor, and he works with traumatic brain injury. He works with um, people who have been through similar. You know, he's walked that path ahead of them. Right, so, so he visits with people in person, and he went into a room, it was an older gentleman, probably around 93 years old or so, and the first visit, it was kind of grumpy, <coughs> kind of grumpy, and, and he said, okay, you know, part of being a volunteer peer supporter is knowing how to read a room, right? So, so he felt, okay, well, I'm just gonna say have a nice day. And the following week, he came back and he saw the gentleman again and he said, how are, you, how are you doing today? Is there something I can help you with? What would, what would make your day better today? And he said, well, you know, they keep on telling me I have to do this physical therapy. I have to do this physical therapy and I can't do it. I'm just so frustrated. I don't know what to do. And, and so he's sitting there in his chair, and he, and he says, in his wheelchair, and he, and he says, I don't, I don't know, do you have any suggestions? Well, the volunteer said to him, you know, tell me, tell me what, why you can't, why, why is it that you can't do the physical therapy? And he said, well, they want me to move my arm, but I can't move my arm because the chair is blocking me from moving my arm, and it keeps getting stuck. He said, hold on, hold your horses, wait just a minute. He went out, he talked to the staff. He had never, this patient had never 
talk to the staff about what he was telling the volunteer. And so it just goes to show that there are things that patients will tell volunteers. They will open up to a volunteer rather than a white coat, right? Someone in a white coat. So, so he went out, he told the staff, and he said, can we just, you know, the, the arms come off. The whole side of the chair comes off. Can't we just take that off for him so we could do his PT? He walked back in there, they took it off, and ever since then he was able to do his physical therapy, and they've been best friends ever since. You know, so, so it's a kind of happy, happy story. Uh, with, with peer support, you can provide telephonic support so you don't have to be there. You can, you can actually, uh, it, the criteria really is either you are a family member, a caregiver of someone who has been diagnosed, uh, or you yourself have had a diagnosis and you've been at least one year post-diagnosis, right? So, so being a peer supporter, it's not, only, it's not only patient to patient, it's family to family as well. And we've got someone in Norwalk, uh, inpatient, that right now we have a peer supporter who, who is providing telephonic support, not only to the patient, but to the daughter of the patient and to the mother of the patient as well. You know, so, so we're looking to grow our pool. We had to start somewhere, right? So, so ideally, I mean, you, you want to start small. We started with three volunteers. Now we have somewhere close to 47 volunteers across all four Connecticut hospitals trained. Um, and we, we have additional volunteers from Poughkeepsie, Vassar Brothers, uh, and Putnam as well. So we're really looking to grow the peer-to-peer -peer support program, and if you'd like to discuss it further, I've left some business cards here. You can feel free to take a business card, and for those of you that are online via Zoom, uh, feel free to email me. My email address is amy, A-M-Y, dot lionheart, L-I-O-N-H-E-A-R-T, at New Vance Health. Dot org. And we can, we can always email out later, um, Rick, I'll send you a copy of the link and perhaps we can email out the video which, which really tells more of a story of two of our peer supporters. So really, you're, in essence, you're serving as a role model. Uh, we have caregiver coaches through the Goldstone Caregiver Center at uh, Danbury Hospital. And uh, I understand that within the next year, hopefully, there will be a similar center. The Goldstone Caregiver Center is the first of its kind in the state of Connecticut. And it's a wonderful place where you can go and families will, will visit the center if there's a traumatic event or if a patient is having surgery. And it's a zen, very zen place. There's a massage chair in there, there's, there's all sorts of reading materials, things like that. Uh, but our volunteer caregiver coaches serve in a similar role to the peer-to-peer -peer support role, but they are really, in essence, they're providing support for the families, the caregivers. So they don't go to visit with the patients, they actually go to visit with the um, family members and caregivers. And it really takes a special breed you know, a special kind of person to provide that level of support. Uh, so, so I would, I would urge you to contact me about that. And, and just really quickly, because I know we're running, running out of time here, I want to also let you know about our summer youth enrichment program. We have a robust summer youth enrichment program. Uh, we look for volunteers between the ages of 16 and 24 during the summer, they typically will come to us either out of high school or college, and we place them in various roles. Uh, in Norwalk Hospital this past summer, we had some students, uh, college students, come to us and they were in the operating room helping out uh, to, to you know, prepare uh, staff, documentation, things like that. 
And they actually were really happy because they got to wear scrubs. <laughs> uh, so, so we place students all throughout the hospital. We look for transport volunteers. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the transport volunteers, if if you have the stamina to be on your feet, you know, for, for a few hours, typically, like Corky said, the volunteers will come in three to five hour shifts, uh, depending on the department, you know, depending on the needs. So, so if you're interested in helping with transport, boy, could we use help with that as well. And that's transporting patients after, typically after they've been discharged, meeting their family at the curb, helping them, uh, you know, to, to exit the hospital safely and you don't do any lifting or anything like that, uh, but you're basically pushing and we train you on how to operate the wheelchair. Again, our emergency department is in need of volunteers. There's probably not one area in our hospital right now that doesn't need volunteers. <laughs> uh, our ICU waiting room, we, we have volunteers who will typically greet families and they're kind of the liaison between ICU. Sometimes it's not always the right time to go into the ICU to visit, so they will clear it with the staff before inviting the family in. Uh, some, some other roles, again, role models. Uh, if, you speak, if you speak fluent Spanish, we're looking for volunteers. I just interviewed a young man uh, who's a college student and he speaks Spanish fluently. He's going to be serving as an ambassador and greeting people when they come in, rounding on patients, helping, uh, helping those patients. Not, again, nothing medical. No one is, you know, volunteers don't do anything clinical and you're not providing any type of medical advice. Even this young man who speaks Spanish, he's not, he's not gonna be doing any medical translation or anything. It's really more of a wayfinding role, but also helping to make sure that the needs are met. So, so I hope I've been, um, hope I've been helpful in, in telling you a little bit more about some of the opportunities, but keep in mind, uh, there's way more than what we, what Corky and I talked about today. So if you're not a front facing person, if you're someone who likes to be more behind the scenes, we have roles that are, you know, office related that are behind the scenes as well. Uh, but, but, um, Please give me a call if you have any questions, and thank you so much. Stay up there because we want to do questions. Oh, yeah. So, stay up there for both of them. We have Steve. Hang on, let me bring the microphone to you. Oh. Um, thank you, that was a very nice presentation. Uh, how many volunteers, uh, in particular at Norwalk, do you have on a shift? So that's an excellent question, and thank you so much for asking. It really depends on the particular job. So in terms of job associations, you know, if we're talking about transport, for example, we have a room, if you've, if you've been into Norwalk Hospital and you've entered through the main entrance, off to the left side, there's, there's a little room, it's for transport volunteers, right? So, so in order for a transport volunteer program to work, you need someone to be the dispatcher, right? And you need at least four volunteers, so a total of five people would be working on a typical shift. And then those shifts are either nine to noon, or it could be noon to two or three, uh, and we're hoping to, to grow it beyond that. But typically our volunteers in the past have not worked uh, at Norwalk Hospital past roughly two or three o'clock. If I could add a little bit to that from my personal experience, a lot of that depends upon the particular department. If we look, for example, at the emergency department, there are a number of activities that occur that require multiple volunteers. Uh, in the waiting room in the emergency department, there's always the need for at least one, and preferably two or three volunteers, certainly during the high volume periods when we have a lot of people coming in for emergency services. 
once a person in the emergency room goes into the emergency room itself and out of the waiting area, uh, there are a lot of beds in there. They're pods, we call them pods. I believe we have four pods, and, and pods have uh, five or six beds in each one of them. And a patient will go into one of those pods, one of those rooms, each one of those rooms need to, needs to be made up with fresh sheets, fresh towels, uh, needs to be cleaned and sanitized. A number of things like that occur. So when we think about the emergency room volunteering activities, there certainly is the waiting room kind of activities. And like I said, there may be two or three volunteers at any shift, uh, depending upon the volume. And the volume changes throughout the day. And also, it changes throughout the day of the week. Uh, but then internally, there's all the, the ongoing maintenance. You know, think of it as a, a, a high volume motel, hotel, that changes that this residence uh, on an hourly basis. Each one of those rooms needs to be cleaned, set up, fresh blankets, fresh towels, fresh tissues, all of that needs to occur. So there we have the need for uh, quite a few concurrent volunteers. In other areas, some of the smaller departments, such as radiation oncology, for example, typically just one volunteer per shift in radiation oncology. Uh, because the needs there are pretty straightforward. It's not nearly as, as, as demanding in terms of one's time, attention, as the emergency room might be. So one volunteer per shift in that department. And that's true of some of the other departments. You move into the radiation oncology area uh, where uh, patients are receiving uh, chemotherapy treatments. There are many more people receiving chemotherapy treatments concurrently than you find in radiation. Radiation, there are two rooms. Uh, one person's on that radiation platform getting radiation at a time. You can't put two people in there. So the most you might have undergoing radiation at any point uh, would be two people, one in each room. Uh, typically just one. Uh, and, and, and so there, therefore, and that, that's an example of only one uh, volunteer being required during a shift. Uh, enter gastroenterology. The same, it's similar, that's similar in, in a lot of respects without the emergency aspect to the requirements of the emergency room. Again, uh, people in the waiting area and then people helping uh, with uh, some of the, I'm going to call it the bed changing and, and housekeeping that goes on in gastroenterology. Uh, hope, that, hope that helps. And, and just to piggyback on what Corky was saying, in terms of the emergency department, so I have a gentleman that's coming in from 7 to 11. Uh, typically during those high traffic times, which usually, you know, people get home from work around 5, 6 o'clock, and they say, oh, you know, I'm not feeling so hot. I better go to the emergency department, right? So, so the later on in the evening, you, you'll have people that are coming in. Uh, and, then, and then, of course, a lot of people will call out from work. They'll come in the morning. We have people that are behind the scenes stocking in the back, and then we also have volunteers that are in the front, in the waiting area, helping to really you know, make sure that those that are waiting to be seen, that their needs are met, uh, and, and really helping to enhance their patient experience as well. As my role as the president of the public, Norwalk Volunteer uh, Organization. I spent a lot of time in a lot of different departments and uh, just focusing on watching, looking, and listening. There was one experience that really stands out in my mind and it was in the waiting room of the emergency department. It was one of those really crowded late Friday afternoons, early Friday evening. And the, the emergency room was, was, was loaded with people, children, adults, uh, uh, various things. And I see this one gentleman sitting very quietly in a corner, and he's got a plastic bag. And I look at the plastic bag, and it's filled with blood, and it also looks like there's a finger in it. And I walk over to him, and, and he, he, he's, he, was, he was Hispanic, and, and I tried to speak Spanish. I don't speak Spanish well, but I tried to. And he holds up the bag, and he's, He's missing a finger in one hand, it's wrapped in bandage, and he's got the finger in the back. And no one was paying any attention to him because he wasn't saying, hey, I need help. He was in an area in which English was being spoken. No one had, had approached him uh, to speak Spanish. He had walked into the emergency room and sat down. And so I immediately brought it to the attention of the emergency room staff, the, the, the outer desk, saying, we really have an emergency here. We have a gentleman who's got his finger in a bag. He needs to be seen right away. So you know that, that's just an example of the value of keeping your eyes open, looking at people, 
see if there's something that you can do. If you just use, use your intuition. You can tell if somebody's in pain. You can tell if somebody's miserable. It, 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 it's all over them, even with a mask. Uh, if they have a mask on, you can tell. Uh, so anyway, I, I just wanted to re relay that, that, that one experience where, where uh, just uh, being alert and looking made a difference. And, and one other uh, opportunity that I'd like to promote is uh, our hospitality cart. So the hospitality cart will have various sundry items on the, on the cart, uh, magazines, you know, things like that. And so we're looking for volunteers to take around the hospitality cart as well at the hospital. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> We'd like to present you each with a Kiwanis mug, so you can thank right. us. Um, I would love to add the both of your emails to our Kiwaniscope so that you can kind of see what we do each week. I would love to do something with you at some point, some type of volunteer opportunity. We'll have to talk about it during the board meeting. Do you do anything, I mean I know it's with minors, but do you do anything in pediatrics where you have volunteers? Oh, yes. 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 Yeah. Is that because we're yes. focused on children? Yeah. That would kind of align with what we do. So maybe there's a good thing to that's, try that, to that's, plan. A, that's a very sensitive area. A lot of the work that we do with pediatrics is actually with the family, mm -hmm. with the parents. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and one of the things that the volunteer organization <coughs> does provide uh, through the volunteer funds are the coloring books and crayons and certain toys for children. Could we hear Don? Give him the mic. Yeah. Yeah. You should have this back. <laughs> uh, yeah, yes, in the pediatric area, there are a number of things that volunteers can do. A lot of this focused on the parents and the, and the family, the relatives uh, of, of the child. But in terms of the children, the volunteer organization does provide a coloring books, crayons, reading books, and toys. Uh, for any of the areas, including the, the emergency room waiting area or in the other areas where uh, a parent may come for treatment and they have, and because of babysitting or, or child care uh, requirements, they bring their child with them, uh, volunteers often. I remember, again, I, I have plenty of stories, but I remember one really charming situation that got to me. Uh, it's about oh, eight, eight, nine years ago. I was volunteering in radiation oncology at the time, and a, a young mother from Southport came in with her daughter for, for treatment. And it was, <clears throat> it was during the planning session where the, uh, the doctor actually maps out on a person's body uh, where the radiation beams will go through the body, through the skin to get to the organ uh, that is being treated. And it's about a 45 minute, 50 minute process of which you end up with uh, ink tattoos. On I, I have ink tattoos in my body. Those, if they're not in any place I'm going to show you. <laughs> but I do have ink, three of them, and those ink tattoos are important because the, uh, the, the radiation equipment aims on those ink tattoos every time you go in, so they're always hitting the same spot. Well, there was this little girl, she was six, seven years old, and uh, she wanted to color, and so I pulled out one of the coloring books from the crayons, and she sat there, and she did the most beautiful coloring job. Uh, it had, had a frog and a duck uh, and, and a few little animals on it and uh, she was just working away on it. She was sitting on the floor and, and fortunately there was a carpet there. And when her mother was through with the treatment, uh, she tore the, the, the picture that she worked on out of her coloring book and she gave it to me. She said, you were so nice to me. Thank you for sitting. And she said this, in a little six you were so nice sitting with me and watching. Thank you. I really appreciate it. This is for you. And, you know, I've, I've never forgotten what she's a, a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful experience. And, and just to share one other thing, we also, uh, we look for teddy bears and other types of stuffed animals uh, because, I mean, they, they can't have any beads on them or, you know, as eyeballs or things like that because we have to maintain, you know, safe, safe environment. But, but we often will do teddy bear drives. And that's, that's one great area where, where folks can volunteer, donate a teddy bear, donate you know, a stuffed animal, and we will put it on the hospitality cart and take it around and give it out to not only patients, but like Corky said, you know, oftentimes people will bring their children with them if, if they can't. Uh, during the pandemic, unfortunately, no one under 18 could, could come along with a, with a patient. Uh, but, but in the past, we've had, we've had many children who come in 
and, and they truly enjoy those, those teddy bears. Are you talking about new or used teddy bears? New. 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 And you should say that. New. Yeah. Yes, definitely yeah. new. But those yeah. are things that we can kind of like consider and see if there's something you can do to have a volunteer morning or a volunteer day where Kiwanis comes into the hospital and you can do something like give out teddy bears or something. I would love to do that. If I can add just one more to that, well, one of the uh, functions within the volunteer department, uh, we, we have a group called Designs for Recovery. Our Designs for Recovery has their own room, and they knit. Throughout the year, they knit things for our patients and for our children. Uh, for example, during the winter season, they knit little gloves, little booties, and little caps uh, for our children to give out to the children that, that come into the hospital, either with their parents or, or, or for care. They also have blankets, children's blankets, that they need to prepare. Uh, they have comfort pillows that they prepare. So this is all done by, within the volunteer organization by Designs for Recovery, uh, with the and completely donated, no, no cost to the patient uh, to receive this, and the materials for Design for Recovery uh, is uh, funded by the volunteer, the volunteer organization. Uh, the volunteer organization has its own financial structure. We, we have a bank, a bank account, we have balances, we have investments, we have all of that. And so we use that to fund a number of things, such as when a, a child is born, for every birth in the hospital, Brahms lullabies play throughout the hospital. Uh, we pay for that, the volunteers pay for that. So every, every time a baby's born, we get a charge, and we're, we're more than happy to pay for it. We have aquariums that we maintain. Uh, that's, that comes out of the volunteer funds as well, so. All right, well thank you both. And